The portals were more confusing now, because the power was out in Morganville. Most places were completely dark, and no matter how hard Claire concentrated, she couldn't pull up three of the distinct dis destinations at all. Which meant she supposed that they no longer existed. She focused on the surroundings of home, but again got darkness. She heard people talking, though, and caught a glimpse of candles being lit. Eve's face caught by the glow. Home. She was getting ready to step through when something hit her from behind, silent and heavy. She lost control of the portal as she crashed forward, screaming. She heard Mernie far behind her. Call out. Claire! Claire, what's wrong? She thought it was one of the inmates until she felt a hand wind wind deep in her hair and lips brush her neck. She heard Bishop's mocking laughter. <laughs> Thank you, he said, for leading me to my fool. He threw her through the portal. She hit the floor on the other side and rolled, then scrambled up and threw himself to the wall. It didn't open for her. She battered at it with her fists. Nothing. Claire turned because it didn't feel like home. Darkness and utter silence. Hello? No one answered. Shane? Mom? She wasn't at the glass house. Bishop had screwed up her destination when he'd thrown her through the portal, and she had no idea where she was. Half sobbing, Claire felt her way across the room. Her fingers brushed soft cloth, and she pulled. Curtain, she thought. She tugged and caught a glimmer through a window. Orange light. Claire pulled back the curtains of the window and looked out at Morganville, burning. It gave her enough light to see the inside of the room where she was standing. It was the same as a glass house, living room in shape, so it had to be a founder house. One of the thirteen, then. But which one? Not Grandma's days, she'd been inside that one, and it had been crammed with furniture. This one was piled with boxes. Claire's gaze fell on the familiar outline of a couch. She walked to it and brushed her hand over the soft curve of the arm. There was a slightly stiffer patch near where it joined with the with the black with the back, which he'd spilt a soda two years ago, but hadn't quite gotten the stinky stickiness out of it. Some of the boxes in the corner were labelled Claire. It was Mum and Dad's new house. Claire mapped it in her head. This house was to the northwest, so if she went to the mirror of her own bedroom, she ought to be able to see toward the glass house. She wasn't sure what that would get her, except maybe a better idea of what her chances were to get back. But she needed to see it, to know her friends and family were okay. There was house on fire that direction, but it was the same one that had been burning earlier. The Melville house. Claire couldn't make anything out past the blaze except a few faintly lit windows. There were, she thought, still safe. A police car raced towards the fire, lights flaring, and Claire slapped her forehead in frustration. Idiot, she muttered. She'd lacked any pockets to put her phone, so she'd stowed it inside her hat. Thanks to the elastic band and the silly little matador cap was still on her head. Claire breathed a sigh of relief as, as she dug the phone from the hole in the lining and dialed Richard Morell. I need a ride. Richard was in the middle of a cell phone rant about how he wasn't her taxi service and how important it was to keep city services moving. When he screeched a patrol car to a halt of the club just out curb outside, Claire jumped down the steps of her parents' house and raced for the door, car door as she threw it open. She made it, slammed the door, and locked it. Richard looked her up and down and no longer seemed pressed and perfect. He was smoke-stained, tired, rumpled. And he was the most lovely thing she'd seen. What the hell are you supposed to be? He asked. Harley Quinn? Is that a Batman villain? I thought you were in a hurry. Richard slammed on the gas and the car screeched away from the curb. Strap in, he said absently. She fastened her seatbelt. So, nice night for you. Peachy, she said. You? Fantastic. He jerked the wheel and nearly spun the car as he took a right-hand turn. They are two of Amelia's vampire buddies at the power station right now, refusing to turn on the lights. And three of them made a standby while the donation centre burnt. You have any idea what's going on? The long game, Claire said. He sent her a look. No, not really. No, but in chess you create openings to make your opponents move the wrong way. Chess, Richard said in disgust. I'm talking about lives, kid. You're starting to scare me. I'm scaring myself, Claire said. She didn't feel like a kid. She felt a million years old and very tired. Just get me home. Because she was going to have to tell Amelia that she just left Mernin alone at Bishop's Mercy. 
Amelia was sitting up when Claire arrived, escorted in by Richard Morell, who was instantly pounced on by his sister and father for hugs and information. She didn't look good, but she looked alive. Sort of. Claire hadn't had any sympathy for her. Mernin, Claire said. You used him. Sam, sitting on the arm of Amelia's chair, frowned at her. Don't. She's very tired. Yeah? Well, we've all got problems. Claire shook off Michael's hand, too. Bishop's blood is the cure. You and Mernin were right. Amelia's expression didn't change. She looked cold, remote, unreachable. All of a sudden, Claire felt a wild urge to hurt her. Badly. So she did. Bishop's there, she said. He's got Mernin. Amelia's eyes focused on hers, and all of Claire's fury melted away. I know, Amelia said. I can feel it. We knew it was a risk using Mernin as a stalking horse, but something had to be done. You can't leave him there. You can't. Amelia sighed. No, she agreed. I can't. I still need Mernin very much. It's far too early in the game to sacrifice him. Claire swallowed hard. Do we mean anything to you? Any of us? Amelia looked around the room at the humans, all wearing purple elastic bandages at their elbows. The sign they'd given blood to save her. At the other, vampi at the other, other vampires, all waiting for commands. You mean everything to me, she said. The survival of my people and yours is all I've ever wanted, Claire. It's why I came here. It's all I've worked for. Her eyes grew chilly and some of the old Amelia came back. I would sacrifice Mernin for it. Oliver, Sam, even myself. But it's not enough. Everyone in the room was still. Shane moved up next to Claire and she was aware of Eve and Michael just behind her. But Amelia was staring right at her. What will you sacrifice, Claire? She asked. To win? It's not a game, Claire said. Amelia inclined her head. True. It is war. And now we have to fight for all our lives. Claire linked hands with her friends. Then tell us what to do. Amelia was quiet for a moment, and then she stood. Claire thought that only those who knew her, really knew her, couldn't tell what that cost. She raised her voice to carry out every part of the room. Our forces must be split, she said. We must not lose the founder houses, the bloodmobile, the university, and common grounds. We will hold. Those who follow Bishop have been promised the freedom to hunt. Those of us who are strong enough will deny them the right. Those who are prey will be armed to defend themselves. This is not optional. All humans will be armed and taught how to strike a vampire. There's no going back from that, Oliver said. His voice was neutral. His expression wasn't. You're giving them too much. I'm giving them equality, Amelia said. Do you wish to argue the point with me now, of all times? Oliver, after a heart-stopping second, shook his head. Then go, Amelia said. Oliver, Eve, go to common grounds and hold it. Sam, choose defenders for each founder house, at least two vampires and two humans per house. Michael, Richard, go to university. I will call the regent. We'll have you. You'll have all you need. Her gaze moved to Claire. I need you with me, she said. We will fetch Mernin. Bishop's there, Claire reminded her. I am well aware. We will take precautions. Shane cleared his throat. You're not going anywhere without me. I'm afraid we are. I have a very special job for you, Shane Collins. I'm not going to lie this, am I? She smiled. Didn't think so. Shane finished under his breath. You'll be in charge of the bloodmobile, Amelia said. And one other thing. Well, the blood meal isn't bad enough. Amelia reached in her pocket of her crystal specked robes and pulled out a small leather bound book. It looked really, really familiar. It was a book that had gotten them in so much trouble before. The book Bishop wanted. You'll be in charge of this. She said and held it out to him. He took it, and as he did, Claire realized what Amelia had done. She just made Shane the bait. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the um, the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. 
Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug because I want to do this as well as also I have to do this because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do without having a charity case behind it, which I feel I don't want it to be like a situation like, oh, I'm only doing this for the sake of cancer, which I'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer, but I did cancel this series a long, long time ago. It came to my recent attention that I should redo this in a better format, and I feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way. Back in, in 1st of November, back in 2020, Rachel Kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma. Now, in the description below is going to be a link that you can, it's going to be a link so you can support the uh, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's being cured, once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that, it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world. It's just that this charity is based in UK. I live in the UK, so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time. And I feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any Rachel King books that we do during the Morganville series or any future series that we do. Obviously, this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them. So any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma because it is a rare, rare cancer and there is not a very good survival rate. So just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Kane succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team together we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.